I'm going to talk about participatory integrated watershed management, some principles, uh, some experiences of two projects. One, the Kigero River Basin Transboundary Agroecosystem Management Project, which works in Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. And a CEDA-funded uh, project, strengthening capacity of farmers to adapt to climate change through land and water management. I will talk about some issues, strategies, and actions. And then I'll bring together some lessons learned on making a case for investing in and promoting participatory integrated watershed management for food security and climate resilience. This is the Kigera River Basin. It's a typical situation in, in Eastern and Southern Africa, degradation, soil burning, um, lots of charcoal production, deforestation, livestock pressures, and we can't just look at the degradation, we need to look back at what's the causes and what's the drivers of these changes. And we have a very ambitious project. The aim is to um, put in place sustainable land management in 21 districts across this huge basin. And in order to do that, we need to look at the, um, what's happening in terms of population pressure, in terms of fragmentation of land, over-exploitation, what's happening in terms of tenure insecurity, which is the driver of poor management practices, differential access, low knowledge base. There's a market demand for commodities, but not necessary for integrated systems approaches, and in general, weak policy support. So how to address all these issues? And the first step is the community awareness of how they can benefit from restoring their ecosystem how they can benefit from getting more productivity, but a better lifestyle from their own environment. And this is a key step in developing a watershed plan. It involves lots of dialogue, discussion with all the actors, and then identifying practices that are already being used in the basin and that can be replicated, improved, and developed. And the key issue here is that soil and water conservation is very labor intensive. So one really has to show the benefits in terms of productivity so that farmers will adopt spontaneously rather than having to be pushed um, in order to do the changes. Diversification is the way to increase the income. So one needs to look at the multiplicity of opportunities in the landscape, crop, livestock, um, forests, trees, fruits, vegetables, etc., And one can put together a whole range of practices um, in the watershed, in the, the appropriate positions to really get a better productivity. And then farmers will, will invest in that by themselves without having to be um, led by a project. Uh, we need to build on local knowledge and innovation. This is an example where we're documenting best practices across the basin. And this is one of the best practices where water is being harvested from small roads, collected on farm, and m managed through mulching and reducing evaporation. This is another one where the farmers are building diversion ditches and then progressive terraces and um, putting this across at a landscape scale. So it's a really important process to document this, but also to show what are the costs and what are the benefits so that one can um, obtain investment funding to scale up. Uh, it's very important today to show the importance in terms of reduced resilience to climate change, because that's where the government investment is. That's where money is available to address climate change. So we have to show that land and water management is actually contributing to um, climate change adaptation, but also to mitigation as well as increased productivity. If one can um, implement these practices across a landscape, obviously one has a range of benefits. So we need to document not just on farm, but what are the impacts at a landscape level. And here we have um, some examples of wetlands that are well managed for rice production, but also the slopes that are well managed um, through bench terracing for 
wheat production or for other crops. Um, what we're trying to do here is this is not just a crop specific process. Um, there's a lot of tree planting going on along the contours across the slope as well, but that's not yet very visible because it's still about the third year of the project. Um, and what's very important is monitoring the impacts in terms of productivity, biodiversity conservation, above and below carbon, soil restoration, marketing and income, and community empowerment. Um, we're also using the farmer field school approach for capacity development. And this is a participatory learning and action research process where the farmers learn by doing, by monitoring, by reviewing what their progress is. And then we use various tools to assess knowledge change, what they would like to learn the next season. And it's an iterative process. Um, What's important is to document the benefits, and we use the WACAT tools. WACAT is um, the World Overview of Conservation Approaches and Technologies, which has developed with FAO and partners some questionnaires for assessing different practices. These are assessed on the ground and put into a database, and then the database produces, can produce very nice extension materials and books that can be used then for scaling up with partners. So we're trying to use this in the projects we're working in. Uh, it's important to show the off-site benefits and the off-site may be disadvantages of different practices because maybe if you're collecting all the water upstream, then the water's not getting downstream. So we have to understand that an intervention may have a cost, but it may also have a, a disadvantage and then to weigh up and to analyze with the different stakeholders. We need to also find out that there are low cost, cost interventions that farmers can take up on their own behalf without having to need investment. And then the other issue is public-private partnership to bring in private sector to invest in watershed management through, for example, payments for environmental services. And here on the right we have some beautiful lakes that are really important for ecotourism in Uganda. And on the left-hand side, the hydroelectric power station, you can see the color of the water. Obviously, their costs of treatment of water are very high. And so if you can show that by improving the watershed management, you can have an effect on the water quality, you may get a partnership going. The CEDA project, funded project in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania has a four-pronged approach, restoring soil health, water management, livelihood diversification, and building resilient communities. And one of the areas in Ethiopia is the Waruba watershed in the Awash Basin. You can see it was very degraded when the project started. And um, the watershed is about 600 hectares, a typical watershed intervention. And a lot of effort was put on practices to retain surface runoff, rainwater harvesting, rotational and zero grazing practices, biological conservation, and also the soil management. And um, also uh, efforts were put into local governance and livelihood diversification. This is really important. Community bylaws for better regulating practices in the watershed energy saving stoves to reduce the deforestation for charcoal, for example, and diversification of income sources. Um, this, if feed farmers can see the benefits, then let's say putting in beehives in a forest, then they'll be much more likely to protect that forest rather than cutting it down. This is a very important slide because I'm not talking very much about tenure but it's critical to um, watershed management. Here we have in Tanzania an example of an irrigation scheme downstream, and the upstream settlers had no investment, and um, they're very poor smallholders. Small they were being blamed for water taking, using all the water upstream, for causing damage downstream when there was flooding, 
the government, with local government, was trying to find the upstream users for bad practices or push them off the land. They were using the um, legal recourse. And in fact, through getting the two groups to talk together, upstream and downstream, coming up with a consensus um, and collaboration, there was a possibility for the two actors to really help each other to invest in the upstream and to then um, find, uh, find solutions. And so if there is conflict, conflict resolution is a really important part. But it also, so I'm, I didn't really mention the tenure, but the tenure is, issue is a major issue because if people are not secure on their land, they're not going to invest. And that was the situation. These smallholders were not secure. They had moved in in the 1980s. They didn't have secure rights. And that was part of the reason for the poor practices. So part of the watershed plan is getting security of tenure for those farmers. Um, some of the results in this particular um, watershed was that 380 households reduced water scarcity. There was improved soil and water management, so reduced flash flooding. There were ponds which allowed farmers to diversify, etc. And it's really important to monitor these benefits. Lessons from these two projects. One is strengthening the capacity of small farmers to adapt. So um, making sure that you're really uh, meeting their needs and problems, but also addressing issues of gender. Here you see women walking with water. You see also women working in the field. By a community approach, one can see, get a better balance of labor by really just raising awareness in, of the community members and seeing how the men can also, also participate in activities. Um, capacity development, it's ensuring continuous support from the service providers, the policy makers, through a collaboration with the farmers. Um, so it's dialogue with the different actors. Um, and ensuring a long-term approach so that all the actors in a watershed have a common strategy, but that strategy is a revolving strategy. It's updated on a regular basis, and it involves all the stakeholders and sectors to intervene and to be working together. Um, and also the importance of getting data for in, um, further investment. So we work at various scales, from the farm to the river basin scale, and from the farmers the communities, the technical sectors, the river basin authorities, so various levels. And we work with the different institutions, community and catchment planning, district land use planning and budgeting, and support for sustainable land management, and the policy making, making sure the policy makers are involved and, and integrate and mainstream watershed management into their national strategies. And finally, raising awareness of policymakers and making a convincing case that land and water management is crucial for climate resilience and that we have a degradation scenario which is pretty sad, natural capital being lost, poverty, food insecurity, risk, migration to cities. There's an alternative win-win scenario, restoring ecological services and if one puts one's efforts together, one can really come out with addressing the key challenges of most governments, which are poverty and food security. But it does mean we've got to make some changes. We've got to bring together the biodiversity strategies and action plans, the national action plans for desertification, and the climate change action plans as part of the mainstream agricultural strategies. And if they remain separate, we're not going to achieve anything in the long term. This is crucial that we find ways to bring these together and the landscape or the watershed approach can maybe help us to do this. Thank you. Oliver Springate, UEA again. I just wanted to uh, ask, how do we work at the basin level uh, transnationally, particularly in terms of um, damming of river basins? The Kigera River Basin is a transboundary river 
leading into Lake Victoria. It carries 24% of the water leading into Lake Victoria. You saw the color of the water. There's no way in a four-year project we can think about having any impact on the color of that water, on the sediments, on the problems. But if we can show through a watershed approach that that's what the government needs to be doing, investing at a larger scale with the other actors and partners, and through collaborating with the other countries, because the water runs from, from um, Burundi and Rwanda through Uganda and Tanzania into Lake Victoria, there's a need for collaboration and cooperation. So at the moment, there's discussions on putting in a hydroelectric power station at one of the um, points between Rwanda and Tanzania. And we, we're trying to show the government on the need to invest in payments for environmental services to really help the communities to then protect that hydroelectric power station. So one does need to work at all levels, from the local community to the national governments, but also the transboundary issues. And we did the same in the Nile Basin. It's another example where FAO provided support to all the Nile Basin countries to improve all the countries' capacity to negotiate in terms of water allocations from the Nile Basin. And this is still a major issue. Egypt uses a, a huge amount of the water of the Nile Basin. And the other countries have a much weaker negotiating power. And so you need one, so the, project, the projects over many years with Italian funded support were to help the negotiating, the data information of the other countries to negotiate. So negotiation, conflict, collaboration, really at all levels. I would say in the Kigera Basin, um, it's a Jeff funded project and it's far too ambitious. But if we can show enough impact on the ground, the idea is to work with districts so that they will actually be putting in a budget line in their district budgeting and planning for watershed management and sustainable land management. That way it can become a sustainable long-term program. My name is Lotta Semsen. I work for Stockholm International Water Institute in, in Sweden. It seems like you've been running very fruitful and successful projects. Would you say that do you still have a driver in the way of a project of organizations coming there and starting the projects? Or is the approach kind of uh, self-evolving amongst local societies? I think that it fundamentally land tenure is crucial for getting investment in land and water management. And in Rwanda, they've actually put, given, given every farmer a title now. Uh, it's been a program that's been, in, in, that's been running for about five years. And it'll be very interesting to see what change that will bring. Um, there are a number of other countries that are following suit. Um, there are very few examples where land tenure has really been approved across a, a whole country like it has done in, in Rwanda recently, so I think it would give a good case. The FAO has developed the voluntary guidelines for responsible um, tenure of land, fisheries and forestry to try and address this tenure issue um, from a policy perspective. Um, but what's really important is that from my experience, it's really important to go hand in hand with the local level, securing tenure through a management plan. And I think it's not necessary to come up with the ownership. One can actually secure tenure rights through having um, rights of use for a longer period of time already. That will give um, farmers the opportunity to think about their longer term vision rather than thinking from season to season or from year to year. So the land and water management, if it's managed well, then obviously there's a risk to land tenure because people might be pushed off the land when they manage the land well because somebody else wants that land. And that's a real issue in Africa where um, a lot of people don't have titles to their land. So yes, it can be a double-edged sword. Thank you.